We're delving into what I like to call the sensitive skin knowledge gap. Despite the prevalence of sensitive skin, there's still much to learn and understand, both in clinical practice and within the broader dermatological community. To help us explore this topic, I'm thrilled to be joined by two distinguished guests, Dr. Friedman and Dr. Erica McCormick. Both have been actively involved in working with the Global Sensitive Skin Faculty by Galderma, and thanks to them, they are helping to advance our understanding and management of sensitive skin. In this episode, we will discuss how sensitive skin is diagnosed in clinical practice, the opportunities available for dermatologists who want to specialize in this area, and the critical gaps in knowledge that still exist today and need to be addressed. We'll also explore the unique collaboration between Galderma and George Washington University, which is paving the way for future innovations in sensitive skin care. Whether you're a dermatologist, a researcher, or someone living with sensitive skin, that includes me, this episode offers valuable insights into the challenges and advancements in the field. Let's w- welcome Dr. Adam Friedman and Dr. Erica McCormick to the Derm Club podcast. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Dr. Friedman, can you share what is the Global Sensitive Skin Faculty by Galderma? Yeah, so I think unlike so many of the misnomers and diseases named after people, the name of this or uh, this group, this interdisciplinary group, uh, really hits on what our goals and purpose is. You know, so this is a cohort of internationally recognized physician scientists, dermatologists, and members of industry, uh, with the main focus on covering the gamut of what is sensitive skin, what are the underpinnings of disease, and I highlight that that this is a true medical condition, not just a symptom. Uh, but also, what do we do about it? And, and under the, and I'll call it the GSSF for short, um, in the interest of time, of course, um, you know, under this, there are three tip general pillars. First is research into what actually is sensitive skin, uh, literally from bench to bedside, uh, you know, from the cellular level to the, you know, global epidemiology and prevalence of disease. Um, then how do we develop things to address these issues based on the underpinnings of disease. And then lastly, um, under kind of healthcare practitioner and even consumer engagement, how do we make this visible? How do we share the lessons learned in an appropriate way that really personalizes that information for the target audience? Um, so, so really it is an all encompassing group to bring to light a very common condition that is uncommonly taught, that is uncommonly uh, talked about, uh, because as, you know, to your point, you are one of many who are probably suffering somewhat in silence, and we'll get into the burden of disease and the impact of that silence uh, down the road in this podcast, um, but it is a huge issue that unfortunately is still fledgling in the scheme of things. And what exactly brought you to join? What's your role in the GSSF community? And why was it exciting for you to be in this community? Yeah, so I think like all great science, it's kind of by accident. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think I have the greatest job in the world. I get to do literally everything in my role um, as chair and program director. Uh, I get to do research, teach, community engagement, advocacy. Um, and from a research perspective, um, I, I do have a little bit of research ADHD. I like kind of doing everything, mm-hmm. bench research, clinical. But one of my kind of one of the things that draws me to clinical research is gap identification. Like I love identifying gaps in clinical care, in education. Um, to that point, you know, we, we've done a certain amount of work of improving the inclusivity of our educational resources. Uh, Another area that Galderma has invested in and supported in terms of uh, creating uh, educational resources for residents and beyond that show the gamut and spectrum of how skin disease looks different on different skin tones, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, But in thinking about sensitive skin and not even necessarily calling it a unique disease state, that is clearly a huge gap. And so I, I think to the point of how did I even get involved, it has to do with 
relationships and you know networking with respect to having a kind of long-standing relationship with Galderma in different facets of both you know medical and education and I was presented with this opportunity and I'll be honest when I first heard about it I was like what on earth are you talking about like what, what do you mean sensitive skin we're, we're focusing as an independent thing I, I, I had no clue and that I think highlighted the gap that even in my many roles I really had no idea what they're talking about and that's what really drew me to it that's how they kind of pulled me in and that there there were clearly huge gaps and there's actually been research going on for well over a decade that i wasn't aware of um so to me the fact that this is an uncharted territory that there is so much to do and so little we know uh not to mention our colleagues know so little about this and uh to no fault of their own because it's not part of for example resident or even semi education you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity. So Erica, we heard from Dr. Friedman why he was excited to join the GSSF. What about you? Why, what was your role in this um, global sensitive skin faculty and why is it exciting for you? Absolutely. I think um, as many students and people starting out their career would say, I owe it all to an amazing mentor, which was Dr. Friedman. Um, and so I was Galderma's inaugural a Sensitive Skin Translational Research Fellow. And so during medical school, I took a year off to dedicate to this research position. And my role was exciting because I got the whole year to dedicate to moving the needle on this research. And so to be a part of the team, I really just soaked up all the knowledge, like Dr. Friedman was saying, from these experts. Um, I remember the first meeting that we had just faculty from all over the world putting their minds together about their clinical experiences and little bits and pieces of research they had either done or heard about about sensitive skin and then I got to distill that down identify the gaps with Dr. Friedman and then really put our minds to doing some research and um, getting some real amazing projects done during our year so it was, it was really really exciting to be a part of. Very cool experience. Dr. Friedman, could we talk a little bit about how exactly sensitive, sensitive skin is diagnosed in clinical practice? And this is a great lesson for not only myself and for the rest of the community, but you know, right now I could really use this knowledge. So can you share that with us? Yeah, it's kind of an easy answer. It's not, right? I think you know the, the mere fact that you're asking this question um, argues that we need mechanisms to make that diagnosis. And that even you know, taking a step back, thinking about it as an actual condition, not just a symptom. And I think that's where we really struggle with sensitive skin syndrome. And, and there are parallels in dermatology. You know, I think, think about hyperhidrosis, right? We have primary idiopathic hyperhidrosis, secondary, meaning that that excessive sweating four times what's actually needed to thermoregulate is uh, due to some underlying condition, but it's kind of an invisible skin disease because sweating is normal. Now, sensitive skin is not normal, but for many, sensitive skin is invisible. And we know that certainly if you have a kind of open-ended definition to sensitive skin, many people can argue that there is sensitive skin associated with primary inflammatory skin diseases, acne, rosacea, eczema, psoriasis, the list goes on and on. So I, I think that there's a, a, a lot of difficulty in really honing in on what is truly sensitive skin syndrome as an independent entity. And there are many out there who only have that as their only dermatologic complaint versus sensitive skin as a symptom of other issues. And then that's where I like to think of there's primary sensitive skin syndrome and there can be sensitive skin associated with primary skin diseases. So there is not a kind of one size fits all that is being currently employed. Fortunately, there is a tool that can be utilized. Um, it's called the Sensi Scale 10. This was actually a validated research tool that is actually not that hard to employ into clinical practice. I find that a lot of the research tools that we are forced to document in our notes uh, because we have no other clinical tools that we can kind of communicate to payers that this person needs X drug or whatever, every advanced therapy. Um, but this 10 portion, this 10 part tool uh, validated back in 2014 uh, by actually one of the uh, members of the GSSF, Laurent Misery, um, is really easy. You can give it to someone in the, in the waiting room. And what it really does is it looks at over a three day period, the extent of various symptoms 
as well as clinical redness. Um, I know we say erythema is redness, but I want to say really redness because red isn't always red. It could be purple, it could be brown, it could be black, depending on skin tone. Um, so really, you know, erythema associated with those symptoms, um, that could very quickly assess whether someone has sensitive skin defined by 13 points or higher on this scale. Um, but I will tell you, most people don't know about this scale. Um, and we've done, we actually performed some research, which uh, Erica will, will talk about later on, that showed that majority of people never even heard of this scale, even though it's been around for over a decade, yet many would be open to using it. So as of right now, that would be the best way to approach this. But I, I think a bigger issue is, all right, even when you identify someone with true sensitive skin, independent of anything else, what do you do about it? And that's really a big piece of GSSF and uh, some of the kind of clinical research arm in terms of looking at how specific products and ingredients can be beneficial for those with truly defined sensitive skin. Because how can you study a condition if you actually don't define the parameters of that condition? So I, I love your question because it allows to say that people really aren't. They may be talking about it, but it's so variable in terms of how it's being defined and how it's being relayed to the patient that I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of standardizing how we diagnose, just like how we diagnose psoriasis, atopic dermatitis. And I like the atopic dermatitis um, analogy because that's a clinical diagnosis. So is this, at least for right now. Um, but I think the easiest way would be to utilize the Sensi Scale 10. It makes sense. So Erica, What's been your training on sensitive skin as part of your student education? Um, to answer similarly, I feel like it has been virtually non-existent. I think I had a pretty unique experience because I, you know, during medical school did this research, research fellowship focused on sensitive skin. But other than that, it is not really mentioned. I am a fellow sensitive skin sufferer, and it was really validating to you know, from a medical perspective, be able to get some of my questions answered. Um, I think in general information, people talk about it um, within society, but it's hard online to find the right information. It's hard to know when you go to the store what products to use, what you should be avoiding. Um, and I think some of the environmental triggers of sensitive skin are not even talked about at all. Um, it's mostly focused, like Dr. Friedman said, on avoiding these known irritants um, when it comes to skincare products. So from a personal level, um, no, it hasn't really been there. And I think some of the data we saw about residents, too, um, it's a mixed bag, but residents also have some gaps in uh, knowledge and education on the sensitive skin as well. Yeah, I can definitely relate. I mean, in medical school, I did not learn anything about sensitive skin. Only like Dr. Friedman said, if it was like a consequence of a certain medication that we were prescribing. Um, but I will say yesterday, kind of ironic, I was at, I was working in the clinic and with a different, with a certain provider. And this patient said, you know, I have sensitive skin and I go to the, uh, the drugstore and there's like 50 million creams and lotions. I don't know what to buy. So to the provider's credit, he brought out a list and he said, these are my top recommendations for sensitive skin. And this is, you know, my, the top three are my favorite. And she's like, oh, this is so helpful because finally I can go to the store and narrow it down. So I think maybe we're making baby steps in the right direction. Thanks to both of you. Well, I want to comment to that fact. So I, I think that's an interesting point about how if you go into, you know, any any drugstore, pharmacy, uh, online, there is a mile long aisle of products, over the counter products, you know, moisturizers, you name it. And there are many that are targeting sensitive skin and they, they use that that language on the bottle. Now, this is not a drug claim. So the problem is there are many products out there that say for sensitive skin, but what does that actually mean? Because if you're, once again, if we don't have a definition of the condition, if we don't have a tool to define disease and then measure change over time, what are you actually saying? And actually one of, one of the studies, which we can get into in a bit, that, um, that Erica spearheaded was looking at one, who, you know, how many people have sensitive skin in a small cohort in an area of DC, but also those who do, are they more likely to buy a product for sensitive skin? And actually does it address their issues? And while they were like seven times more likely to pick a product that said for sensitive skin, the majority said they actually made, the, these products made them worse. 
<laughs> so uh, we, we know in the over-the-counter space, it, it is the Wild West. You know, uh, there's language that is allowable under the FDA Cosmeceutical Act that refers to the uh, experience, not so much changing biology, but that, that I think is also a very confusing piece when it comes to sensitive skin because of the fact that it has not really been well defined. But that is a big piece of what we're doing at GSSF is not just saying, hey, we got a bunch of products that probably be great for sensitive skin, but actually proving that point using a validated research tool to show that change over time. <laughs> um, well, are there any opportunities, Dr. Friedman, available if a dermatologist chooses to specialize in this area and have you know, more expertise than another dermatologist and they really want to enhance their knowledge and their the way that they can help patients in this typical area. Um, and also like when, at what point did you realize there was a gap to be addressed? I understand that, you know, when Galderma approached you and they mentioned it, this, you're like, what do you mean? And then it kind of triggered like, oh, there is a gap, even with myself, who's so involved, I do all this research. So I'm just, you know, I kind of threw in two questions there, but I really want to understand, like, if I want to have the dermatologist I work with and the residents I work with, um, you know, become more experts in sensitive skin, what is out there to make that happen? Yeah, I, I think there, you know, in terms of if we think about some of the specialized training we have, like Moe's Fellowships, Term Path, you know, it's, you know, it's interesting. It, it's not even necessarily a core competency from the ACGME perspective. It's not necessarily central to what are core competencies that residents train, you know, residency programs train their residents. So, so in terms of right in this moment, is there specialized training? No, but I, I hope that does evolve. And I think it, it starts at the kind of macro level, making sure that at conferences, international, national, um, offer education on this. So, um, you know, the, the GSSF was founded in 2021, but our first meeting wasn't until uh, the EADV, the European Academy of Dermatology and Venerology uh, Conference of 2022, where we met, but also we held a session on sensitive skin where we actually generated some data that Erica then published uh, about, you know, kind of what's the current uh, a pulse, you know, from, from the dermatology world of, you know, how, how does this play a role in practice? What do you think about it? All that fun stuff. Um, but I think it starts being purposeful and ensuring that this is worked into various educational pipelines. I, I think the fact that the GSSF exists and that we have representation in multiple countries, um, I, I think people often assume that well, I can't reach out. I can't ask, you know, for, for guidance or, you know, I, I don't even know where to go. But I, I think that especially in dermatology, something I love about our specialty is that like 99.9% .9 of us are very welcoming and amicable and cordial. We love working together. And so I, I would argue if someone is really interested in this um, to kind of get in touch with the GSF, get in touch, you know, through whether you're a Galderma rep or something like Galderma, like I think we, for us to be effective, we need to know what everyone is thinking and feeling. And then I think, you know, if you're interested, given the amount of data we're putting out there, you know, keeping an eye on what publications are coming out there, looking out for posters at various co Congresses and conferences. As a dermatologist and a person with sensitive skin, I often struggle with choosing the right products for my skin type. I've become very picky about what I use, worrying about creating more irritation on my skin. It's been a few months now since I've been using the new Cetaphil Gentle Exfoliating Line, and it has become part of my daily skincare routine. It's formulated with a balance of gentle exfoliating acids and skin soothing ingredients. It's so gentle that I can now exfoliate every single day with the confidence that it respects my skin. If like me, you also have sensitive skin, you're likely to experience uneven skin tone and texture and you may want to do something about it. While dermatologists like myself recommend gentle chemical exfoliation products, there are limited options for people with sensitive skin, often leaving only harsh exfoliants to choose from. With its latest product line, Cetaphil is really meeting this specific need. With a cleanser, a face lotion, and a body lotion specifically designed for gentle exfoliation. The Cetaphil Gentle Exfoliating Line is now available on Amazon.com and retailers nationwide. 
For those of you who may not know Cetaphil, it is a gentle skincare brand by Galderma. Cetaphil is recognized around the world, with 9 out of 10 U.S. dermatologists recommending it to their patients. And it's used by millions of people with sensitive skin from all around the world. I recommend Cetaphil to my patients every single day. I am curious, how did the collaboration with uh George Washington University come about and what does it consist of? Why is it unique? I know it's unique because you have these two amazing people here, but why else? (laughs) So in thinking about, well, how do we invest in this? To me, the first thing was, all right, invest in a fellowship because there are just limitless wins when you have a funded fellowship, not just for the purpose of the GSSF, but also for that student or series of students as this is, uh, the the funding was actually a five year program. So five years of fellows uh, for the time being. Uh, but then also was, all right, well, great. We have a, a funded fellowship that also provides funding to go to a conference to support some research. But, you know, research costs money. And I think in academia, the there may have been a time years ago, maybe before my time, where there's just a bucket of money for exploration and innovation. Um, definitely, especially after the pandemic, where I think academic institutions were just eviscerated. Um, that doesn't exist. And so to be able to conduct projects in a meaningful way, you need funding. And so that's where the Research Acceleration Fund by Galderma and Sensitive Skin came about. So it's not enough to, hey, support a fellow. You need to set that fellow up for success. So that kind of dichotomy of research support and funding to be able to take that year and not end up homeless is, um, I, I think, really unique here and and also not a one-off. Like So often it's like, hey, here's a year of support. And then, okay, crickets. The fact that there is longitudinal investment and continuity. So Erica was the first sensitive skin fellow. We're up to our third at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, And each year, it's like handing over the reins, like passing down, you know, what has happened thus far, what knowledge has been gained, but also passing along projects. So day one, our sense of skin fellow is hitting the you know the floor running you know they're already in the midst of, of projects and involved in um in in so many different things um so i think it is a unique collaboration in that it's covering the spectrum of investing in the future of dermatology um positioning research efforts in a way that make them successful in an academic setting and then of course the global engagement of of uh, experts around the world yeah you know i have to say i have to credit almost everything I know up and or everything I knew up until a couple months ago was because of the fellowships I did. And this is even a few years later, you know, they were paid fellowships. I felt very fortunate to get a paid fellowship. And, but I learned a tremendous amount of knowledge and I still like, I'll see something in clinic, I'll see something in a lecture and I'm like, Oh, I saw this. I treated it. It's just amazing. All these years later, it still comes back. And it's really thanks to my fellowship. So thanks to Gal Derma for giving George Washington University this opportunity. Um, Dr. McCormick, could you share with us what have been the results of this collaboration so far? Absolutely. Um, I think so. Dr. Friedman has a very exciting clinical solutions piece out. I'm not sure if you want to set the stage and then I can get into it, but we had a really productive year and the fellows after special shout out to them. They have been just, you know, the momentum is amazing on this project. So I'll let Dr. Friedman start and then I'm happy to get into it. Yeah, so um, it, it's, it's, it's very fortuitous we're doing this now because um, in the September edition of the Journal of Drugs and Dermatology, there's actually a dedicated article that um, covers the gamut of what is GSSF, what has been accomplished thus far, um, and uh, really, uh, and it's your question about how do people learn more, um, this condenses literally everything that's happened in the last two years, which is to me kind of crazy that it's only been pretty much two years since this all started, and the the number of projects, publications, posters in such a short amount of time um, is pretty wild. You know, often when, when people think about, oh, I want to do research, let me spend a month doing research. You know, somebody's like, like yeah, a month is like a minute, you know? First and foremost, as I mentioned, why I even was excited about this gap. So identifying gaps in education, in research, in consumer perception. So that's one bucket. And, and that I think is probably the area that Erica really uh, drove forward the most. Because when we first started, we're like, okay, where do we start? Well, it's easy to start with gaps. 
then is how big is the need? So I mentioned before, a lot of the studies that are out there certainly hit a couple countries, but they're not global. And also when you think about thinking, when you consider prevalence, you need to make sure that your N, the people you're evaluating, are representative of the overall population of, for example, a state or a country. And so being very purposeful of who you're recruiting for that, that study is really important. And, and we do we did perform, it's still ongoing, the largest global profiling and survey of sensitive skin worldwide, um, which also started year one. And, and Eric and I were, were fortunate enough to play a role in crafting that survey and analyzing that data, which is still certainly coming in. Then if we're going to say this is an independent disease, well, there should be unique pathophysiology. Um, and, and one of our, our GSF members, Giovanni Pelicani, has done a lot of work in that area in terms of defining the anatomical, immunologic, and even neurocutaneous changes in sensitive skin. But then also, if we're calling it a medical condition, well, most medical conditions have comorbidities. And so exploring mm -hmm. comorbid disease that may share similar pathophysiology is another piece. And then last but not least, which of course, that's what everyone wants to know is what on earth do we do about this? Like, that's all cool. It's a prevalent problem, unique pathophys, so what? And that's where really taking clinical trial data and digesting it and, and putting it in a form that's easily digestible for the masses to um, inhale, so to speak, uh, is probably the last piece of that. Now, when I was uh, starting the fellowship, we did a pulse check on all the data that was out there and all the information. And I still feel like we were looking at each other like we we don't have a full understanding of what sensitive skin is. It's, you know, mentioned so commonly in society. Dermatologists mention it. Everyone is talking about it. But when you ask everybody, everyone has a different definition. And so we mm -hmm. wanted to both look at dermatology residents and then also practicing healthcare professionals in dermatology to see what they thought sensitive skin was. And so those were our two big first uh, studies. Well, the first one was of dermatology resident physicians in the US. And so we had a survey sent out to them to figure out what their exposures to sensitive skin were in their residency education. And also we gave them a checklist of different history taking items, management items, uh, patient counseling items, just to see if they had a patient in front of them with sensitive skin, what would they be doing? Um, and we had a lot of interest. The dermatology residents, 99% of them thought that sensitive skin should be included in some capacity within their residency education, um, which I agree. I think patients are really often presenting with sensitive skin, um, and they wanted to know, how am I supposed to be approaching this patient? Uh, but less than half of those residents had actually specifically had education about sensitive skin within their residency training thus far. And unfortunately, less than 25% of the residents we surveyed actually said that they would feel very knowledgeable about diagnosing or counseling or managing a patient with sensitive skin. And so, like Dr. Friedman said, you know, ding, ding, that was a big gap. Residents are interested in learning about sensitive skin but they really aren't, you know, effectively being taught it at this time. And a lot of it is not really, you know, to fault of the teachers within residency programs. It's because there's not great resources uh, for education right now um, about sensitive skin and, you know, all coming back to the root issue of we still are learning exactly what this condition is and, and the depth of it. Um, and so residents that did receive education, I think it's important to mention when we did go through some of those items of history taking and counseling and management, uh, we found that they were significantly more likely to do some of the things that we know are important for sensitive skin. And so they were more likely to ask the right questions during history, um, including all the products that a patient is using over the counter otherwise, and also to be aware of the environmental triggers of sensitive skin um, and to bring that into the discussion as well, um, which was very, very interesting to note. And if Dr. Freeman wants to comment any on that. Yeah, no, I, I think the, the other thing we did in the survey was we presented the Sensi scale to the residents. And mm -hmm. of course, no surprise, no one had heard of it, but a, a, a overall majority of residents responding to the survey, which of no, we had, I think, uh, well over 200, I, I'd say probably close mm -hmm. to maybe 
a third of residents in the country responded to the survey, the majority said they would use this if they even knew about it. So um, very reassuring. Absolutely. Erica, I would imagine, given your expertise and knowledge in this area, how will it impact you on your next phase of your career? Oh, it absolutely um, has been a topic of conversation. And I think, you know, hopefully I'll continue to be involved with these efforts. And I definitely am keeping updated on all the amazing work that Dr. Friedman and the other fellows and the rest of the GSSF faculty are doing. Um, but it was brought up a lot. Um, I think on the interview trail and in different people I've met at conferences and I was presenting the data um, from our research, people were asking me, you know, what is sensitive skin? <laughs> asking my opinion and, you know, trying to get information about some of the research we did during my year. So it was amazing. I think also um, another big thing and kind of to get into the second part of some of the research we did um, was that we engaging with the community and engaging with patients directly about sensitive skin. It was amazing. I think it was really validating for them to have a healthcare provider look at them and agree sensitive skin is a real thing um, and that we are trying to compile information for you on how best to manage your condition. And so when we, you know, after part of this educational gaps that we noticed, we also wanted to look at what is the epidemiology right now of sensitive skin. And like Dr. Friedman alluded to, um, there was really a gap in uh, the experience, the diverse experience of sensitive skin, especially in persons of color in the U.S. And so we wanted to do a survey uh, to pilot it that we would eventually roll out globally to profile sensitive skin. We wanted to focus on a population that predominantly self-identified as persons of color. And so we disseminated this survey at a skin health fair in Washington, D.C., um, and 86% of those people self-identified as persons of color. And so we were really um, excited to be able to get some of that information to fill that gap. Um, and 60%, around 60% of those people reported that they had sensitive skin, which was on par with some of the numbers um, that we had seen before. This was a small survey. There was just over 50 respondents, uh, but it was really our aim to get a little bit of information and then also test out the survey methods that we were hoping to roll out later at a larger scale. Um, and 80% of people with sensitive skin who had no other primary skin disease had actually seen a dermatologist uh, before. Mm -hmm. And so that was really interesting to see that whether or not dermatologists are ready for it, patients are coming uh, with sensitive skin and even without other skin diseases, they're looking to dermatologists for that information. And I think that survey was also where we started to see some of the patterns and triggers, uh, which were eventually validated in the larger global, global profiling survey that we did. Um, and so we saw really high rates of reactivity to products for sensitive skin. Um, Dr. Friedman already mentioned some of the numbers there. But skincare products were really commonly triggering sensitive skin, as well as sweat, extreme temperatures, stress, and diet. And of people that had sensitive skin, 90% uh, of them had reacted to at least one of those top five triggers. And so I think dermatologists aren't necessarily aware of some of the other things. Um, and so that's what we're hoping to get out. But, you know, after this smaller pilot survey, we were able to refine the method a little bit. Um, and then we rolled it out to over 10,000 people globally. Um, and Dr. Friedman was able to present some of that data just last year. So I'll let him kind of get into it. But yeah, I think what, one of the things that is is reassuring is that even with some of these smaller studies, there are some consistent patterns. You know, I think one of the most important things when it comes to any type of research is that it's reproducible. And whether it be this small pilot survey study we did in Southeast DC to some of the uh, older studies that certainly had a good number of people value it, but not to the level of, um, you know, thousands of people worldwide uh, covering multiple continents, you name it, um, but certain things still rang true. So first, the global prevalence of sensitive skin, all comers, roughly about 70% plus, you know, plus minus, depending on what study you're looking at. And of those 40 plus percent reported moderate to severe sensitive skin, that's what we really want to hone in on. 
I think one of the important things and also consistent things is that of those, 40% had no other skin issue whatsoever. Mm. And that's what's really important, that from study to study, whether it be a study of a couple hundred to actually now, and the, the global profiling is a living, breathing organism that's continuing to bring in data. So, so now actually the numbers are over 16,000 respondents. And even with that, the numbers are consistent. 70% plus globally, 40% of those with moderate, severe sense of skin have no primary skin condition. So we feel really good to say that sensitive skin syndrome is a true independent uh, condition. Um, but there were some nuanced things that really were, I want to, some surprising, but also were new. So, you know, I think we harp on the whole topical agents, cosmeceuticals, over-the-counter products, prescription products. Those are the number one driver of sensitive skin. That is actually not true. Based on this global survey, that actually dropped down to like number four on the list. Number one was extremes of temperature, and especially mm -hmm. focusing on heat. And sweat got in there a little bit too. So, um, and, and that even just identifying that led to other projects who were like, that's so interesting. So heat, temperature changes, you know, thermoregulation may play a role in uh, exacerbating sense of skin. Those who already have a predilection to it, that might set it off. So that's something we, we were surprised by. Something else that came up that was really interesting was that the darker one's skin tone, the more severe the sense of the skin, especially when we think about pain as one of the symptoms, Overall, itch was the most common symptom reported, but when you started to get to darker skin tones, the prevalence of more severe sense of skin went up and pain was a more notable feature. Mm. So um, while it's great to see those consistencies because then we feel like, all right, this data is real, even the older data, this is real, but now we're starting to pivot and think about, all right, well, if heat may play a bigger role than we once expected, if certain patient populations have, more, have a greater likelihood for sensitive skin, that gives us insight into pathophysiology. And you know, with that, when I, when I first heard about, oh, well, heat and sweating, I was like, well, what else could possibly be associated with those symptoms? And that going back to, I brought up hyperhidrosis, full circle, going back to hyperhidrosis, I'm like, well, we don't really fully understand the pathophys of hyperhidrosis. Could there be a connection between the two conditions? You know, we know there's overt and, and, and completely superfluous uh, cholinergic stimulation of the sweat glands, inappropriate stimulation of sweat glands. Could there be some connection between the two conditions? And, and with that, you know, with, it always starts with a good question and then you just need an awesome fellow like Erica mm -hmm. to jump on it. And so we, we then looked into that and we partnered with the International Hyperhidrosis Society to really cast a wide net and collect a good number of, of respondents. Um, and I don't want to steal her thunder, so I'll let Erica kind of mention what we found in thinking about are there comorbid diseases with common pathophysiologic threads? Definitely. Yeah, I remember when we, when Dr. Friedman mentioned that question and we all sat there and we were like, hmm, <laughs> let's look into it. Um, and it was really interesting. So we were primarily looking at primary hyperhidrosis. We tried our best. It was a survey study sent out. And we tried to really hone in on people uh, with that due to the, uh, you know, pathophysiology and the aberrant cholinergic signaling that Dr. Friedman was mentioning. And 89% of the primary hyperhidrosis sufferers said that they had sensitive skin. And so, you know, 90% is a lot higher than some of the other percentages that we were seeing in the general population, uh, which shows us that maybe this condition is happening at a higher rate. And, you know, sweat, like Dr. Friedman was mentioning, is a known irritant, and it is known to exacerbate sensitive skin as well. And so we wanted to see, is that the explanation? You know, are people with primary hyperhidrosis sweating more? And therefore, are, is that sweat just causing them to have worse sensitive skin? And so we really got into where exactly they were experiencing sensitive skin and then where exactly they were having the hyperhidrosis to see if we could compare the symptoms of both of those things and see if they were correlated or not. And so people with focal primary hyperhidrosis, wherever, let's say they had axillary hyperhidrosis, um, they did tend to experience sensitive skin at high rates in the axilla, but they also reported severe sensitive skin on other parts of the body, for, on the face, for example. And we used the sensitive scale 10, like Dr. Green was mentioning, the SS10, 
uh, which really gauges those symptoms primarily on the face, since the face is uh, one of the top places that people experience sensitive skin. Um, and they had extremely high scores on the SS10, indicating that they had sensitive skin on the face, even though they weren't necessarily having excessive sweating on the face. Mm. So I think it was a lot of very interesting information um, about this population that can be helpful too. Uh, having people come into the clinic with uh, primary hyperhidrosis, is this something we should be asking them about? Um, is this a better way that we can address these concerns for this patient population? And so it was a very, very fascinating study. I'm happy that Dr. Friedman asked the question. <laughs> Yeah, and I would also imagine, you know, this is frustrating and can have a psychological impact on these patients. So did you implement any, you know, techniques on how to support their mental health when it came to sensitive skin? I think, you know, that's a great point. And there, there's an added burden here. I mean, I, I, I hate to keep bringing hyperhidrosis back into the mix, but th there are so many parallels, not just pathophysiologically, but also the experience of the patient, um, you know, just admitting and validating that this is a medical condition has therapeutic benefit mm -hmm. because just like and, and uh, you know um lisa peretti who is the uh, president of the international hyperdrosis society constantly talks about suffering in silence that added burden i think that's true for sensitive skin it may even be worse and i'm not trying to start fights here in terms of which is worse yeah. or favorites but it may be worse because i think patients with sensitive skin when you hear sensitive there is this kind of biasing, there is this kind of Pavlovian response of like, oh, you're just being sensitive, which is very denigrating. And I think a lot of these patients are dismissed. Stop being so sensitive. It's not really a big deal. Hyperhidrosis patients get that also because sweating is a normal physiologic response. And so where do you draw the line between normal and abnormal? But here it's that like, oh, my skin is so sensitive. People say, well, just stop complaining. It's really not that bad. And so when we say to them, no, this is a medical condition. There are changes in your skin. You know, your skin's barrier is dysfunctional. The array of blood vessels in the deeper parts of your skin are abnormal. The way the collagen, the backbone of your skin is arrayed, also fragmented and abnormal. Like there's actually a bench to bedside kind of, not necessarily explanation, but validation that in it itself has an impact on quality of life. And I, and I remember, I'll never forget this. We always have patients that regardless how many years ago, you, you never forget. And I, I'll say hyperhidrosis and sensitive skin. When I tell patients like, this is not in your head. This is a real condition. You know, hyperhidrosis, there is an ICD-10 code. We can, I can bill a patient for that, which sounds crazy to say to a patient, but that patient, when I said that, actually started crying because they felt that mm. this was a one-off, that they were just weird. It was something they were doing. It's their fault that they could never have a normal life. So sharing that these are true medical conditions, that there is an investment to understand it and treat it, but also that they're not alone. That's so many. I mean, I, I, I would say the prevalence of sensitive skin makes it probably one of the most common conditions that any person could experience or that we will theoretically see in the office. Um, that I think is probably the most important first step to validate the patient. Um, I think that, yes, there are various tools that we know um, from parallel conditions. You know, we know, for example, psoriasis, uh, meditation, uh, exercise, mindfulness can certainly be helpful for chronic inflammatory disease. And sensitive skin syndrome is a neuroinflammatory condition. So certainly a lot of the lessons learned from other inflammatory skin conditions can certainly apply here. But before getting to the nitty gritty and pulling in a team and making referrals, just start simply by acknowledging this is an actual condition that we are exploring, we are figuring it out, and that they they sh they need to really appreciate that they are part, one of many who are suffering and that we are focusing on this. I think just that validation has an incredible impact on those DLQI scores or, I mean, there's so many patient report outcome measures you can think about, but I think start simply there. And I think that will mm -hmm. allow you to partner better with the patient, but also um, it, it really has a therapeutic benefit for them. As we look into the future, what next steps in your research with the global sensitive skin faculty by Galderma are you most excited about? Um, especially those that might improve care and management for patients with sensitive skin. You know, what future innovations or trends are you like really excited that will make a tremendous impact on society? Ooh, I don't know, Erica, you want to start with this one? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I can, I can <laughs> jump on the 
Um, you know, I think there's a lot. To me, I it goes back to that final point of what is all this and why should we care, right? So when we think about all this great research, identifying gaps in training, identifying gaps in the consumer space, the incredible prevalence and impact this condition has on so many around the world, at the end of the day, you need to give guidance of what to do. And I think that's where probably there may be some hesitation up to like, oh, this is really cool and it's very cerebral, but what do I do about it? But I think, you know, in order to be able to answer that question, we need to understand the condition, which we've learned a lot, but there's still more to go. But I, but we're not waiting. So in parallel, I think what's most exciting for me is using the, using the lessons learned, taking a methodical approach, for example, employing the Sensi Scale 10 as a uh, entry point for clinical trials, you know, as part of the eligibility criteria, um, as well as something that we follow over time to once again ensure that the data we're seeing is, is reproducible, and and that is something that's been actually ongoing in terms of a lot of the you know clinical studies that Galderma is pursuing using various over-the-counter products under the Cetaphil brand, um, utilizing this research and I would argue clinical tool to really put your, you know, put, put your money where your mouth is, so to speak, to really be able to say, we're not subjectively evaluating sensitive skin. I think to that point, you know, um, you know, Erica mentioned several times that we asked patients in these surveys, do you have sensitive skin? This was always followed up by going through the Sensi Scale 10. And, and that was an important uh, approach, not just to say, if someone has sensitive skin, what is the likelihood that they truly have sensitive skin based on this tool? But it also, it's great to continue to validate any tool, you know, tools, are only as good as the effort put into them. So over and over again, using this tool to prove the point that this tool is uh, a worthwhile one and, and really can be relied upon to identify these patients. So um, something, you know, I'll, I'll give Galderma credit in that because Galderma is a medical dermatology company that they have an RX arm, they treat their over-the-counter clinical trials like drugs, you know, the, the formulation of these studies, the protocols are very similar to that you would see of a topical being evaluated for FDA approval. And so using multiple page reported outcomes, using various research tools to evaluate how uh, a patient will experience a product and how their condition will approve is so helpful when guiding those recommendations. And in terms of, right, making those comparisons, how do we decide which product to go with with that mile long aisle or the 50,000 options that Amazon will throw in your face when you go online to see what should you get. My, my line to that is show me the science, you know, I'm like the Jerry Maguire of dermatology, show me the mm -hmm. science, show me the proof. And that's the importance here is we need to show the proof to be able to confidently make those recommendations. And so there actually are several studies forthcoming that will hopefully be published soon, looking not only at how does a particular product with specific ingredients well thought out because of what we understand about uh, the pathophysiology of sensitive skin, how do they impact not only, for example, eczema, but patients who have validated through SensiScale 10 scoring sensitive skin, but also understanding what is actually happening on the skin? So looking at changes in microbial populations, you know, we know dysbiosis can be involved in many different inflammatory skin diseases, changes in the architecture of the skin over time. Um, you know, truly translational research, I think we use that term so frequently, just throw it out there, but don't necessarily know what it means, but really like going to the bedside, going back to the bench, back to the bedside, this kind of constant back and forth, we're going to start seeing a whole bunch of studies that employ that methodology, me methodology to really, um, really prove the point if something works or not. It's very reassuring that Galderma's products are, you know, have are backed by science. I have to tell you, like, that makes me want to go in my bathroom and use their product right now because I know that what I'm using is real. It's good for my skin, and and it's actually proven by science. Dr. McCormick, Dr. Friedman, thank you so much for being here and for helping us to close this sensitive skin gap with Galderma, with the collaboration of global sensitive skin faculty. This is a really exciting collaboration and it's such a prevalent condition that you are taking the steps that are necessary to help us really understand this condition. So thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>
I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Derm Club podcast. If you found the discussion today to be valuable, please subscribe and share. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode as we continue to delve into dermatology and skincare with the world experts.